Hello, this is Dr. Mewborn, and this is History of the Baptist. We are in Lesson 19. We've entitled this lesson, Rapid Expansion. We're talking about the Great Awakening, or also we call the First Great Awakening. Let's go ahead and get into our study. A couple of slides that we showed you last time um, were this one, uh, Revival of the Baptist, and we talked about these statistics or these records. In 1700, America held 24 Baptist churches with 839 members. There were no associations or mission organizations at that time. And then in 1790, America had 979 churches with 67,490 members who were grouped in 42 associations, truly called revival. We've got this match stick here uh, being lit and it's lighting up the rest of them and it's going to create a strong flame. And that's what we're talking about. A, uh, churches were experiencing what we call revival. Um, these churches that were kind of dead, uh, people groups were kind of dead, but they had been revived and now they are starting to um, create new churches and plant new churches and do a lot more work. And so that's what we're talking about. Um, and one of the controversies came in with talking about the old lights versus the new light churches. The new light was really those churches who um, helped push and drive what we call as the um, the Great Awakening. And the old lights were those who were kind of against the revival movement. And so we see that in these points here. Great Awakening challenged authority and hierarchy of established churches, old lights, Congregationalists, and Anglicans. And then churches that grew as a result of the Great Awakening, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist are also known as the New Lights. Um, a lot of what they were bringing forth, and they truly benefited from it. And then the Great Awakening said that anybody could be converted and born again. You didn't need traditional church leadership to decide whether or not you belonged. And so it was this idea of preaching to whoever, whoever may come, kind of the, the wording there, Come, you who are weary and heavy laden. Come, you who are, who are hungry and thirsty. Come, you who are poor. Um, and uh, this whole idea is come and you're going to hear the gospel and it's going to change your life. The preaching that was taking place at that time was very strong. A lot of uh, talk of hell and trying to get people to be saved, to give their life to Christ, to uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what was going on during this time. Um, what we see with the old lights and the new lights churches, we also see this with what we call the regular versus the separate Baptist. And so you kind of see this as we define these terms a little bit, but regular and separate Baptist kind of go in line with old and new lights. Um, regulars uh, are the churches that shied away from revival emotions. They pulled away anti-revival in many ways. Separatists uh, you see the believe that the revival experience in the 1700s was a work of God. They believed it was the hand of God that was actually doing it. The divisions that, was take, that were taking place, churches endured splits and divisions after certain members heard revivalist preachers such as George Whitfield. So what would happen is that people would come out to see a revivalist preacher like a George Whitfield. And when they heard him, whether they were um, part of uh, the regular Baptist churches or the old lights, if they were part of that and they heard this message and then they felt stirred inside and somewhat uh, like an outward profession of their faith and they began to have these experiences and emotional experiences that they would that would take place they would go back take that to the churches and of course it would cause division in their churches because it was something strong that they experienced and so this is kind of what was happening at the time I wanted to show you this I thought this was kind of a neat sign South Fork Baptist Church, seven persons baptized in Nolan Creek by Reverend Benjamin Lynn. He and Reverend James Skaggs founded South Fork Church circa 1782, organized as separate Baptist church with its 13 members. It met at Phillips Fort, later moved to South Fork, Nolan, and the past church was assumed philosophy of united, separate, and regular later split over a slavery issue. Kind of this is an old sign, older sign, talking about the later part of 1700s. And But the whole idea here is 
talking about it's a separatist church, a separatist Baptist church, and this would have been going on. These are the people that we're, we're kind of referring to a little bit. But what are the differences in doctrine with regular and uh, separate Baptist? According to the Sandy Creek Baptist Association, separate Baptists believe that Christ is the sufficient Savior of all, and that sinners may freely choose the way of life or the way of death. And so it was pulling away from what was the strict Calvinistic type of teaching um, that God calls, God awakens, God, God goes to them, God makes all those things happen. Now it was going to the people and calling them to believe and putting that on the people. They must come to a belief. They must come to a conclusion. They must surrender. Uh, and, and the reason being is because their soul is in the balance. And that's what you hear. And so the separate separate Baptists were saying, hey, we can bring this to them, a decision, and they need to make that decision to follow Christ. This gave the separate Baptists urgency and zeal when preaching the gospel. Well, of course it did, because what it did was it grabbed the hearts or the heartstrings of these people um, because they were calling them to something. It wasn't something that... Uh, they would; these people would just know over time. It was a moment in time that they needed to respond, similar to that of what was taught for the new lights. Um, I thought this was good to talk about Sandy Creek, Sandy Creek Baptist Church, mother of separate. Baptist churches across the South, founded by Shubal Stearns, 1755. His grave is two miles south. Um, Shubal Stearns is one of those who actually heard the preaching of George Whitfield, and his life was changed by it, and he became what we call as the New Light or a separate Baptist. And of, of course, starting this church, the association that came out of the Sandy Creek, North Carolina area. And so um, this was a, a big movement that was taking place and, and, and the ministry of the separate Baptist teaching just flourished during that time in that area. Uh, continue on, differences in worship of these two. Separate Baptist believed in ecstatic utterances, shouting, weeping, and emotional outbursts. So it was an emotional experience. Regular Baptists believed that the work of God was more mental, rational, and logical. It was something that almost could be calculated. It was something that would could easily be evaluated because it had a systematic feel about it. And so that would be more the regular Baptist and definitely stronger with the uh, Calvinistic teaching there as well. Preaching was less emotional and threatening um, uh, for the regular Baptist. Um, and of course, for the separate Baptist, it was more that way. Uh, differences in education. Separate Baptists believe that formal education was not necessary for gospel ministry. In other words, if God wants a an educated preacher, uh, he would call the educated persons, or educated person, I guess you would say there. Um, also, they believe that the preachers should not receive salaries from their churches. And so, interesting here, when we're looking at formal education, we're looking at things um, such as receiving a salary for this. They said, hey, listen, we don't need that. We need this, the man of God, to go forth and take the gospel of God. Um, regular Baptists believe that the formal education was vital for gospel ministry. Most separate Baptists observed nine rites. Baptism, Lord's Supper, love feast, laying on of hands, um, and then foot washing, um, anointing the sick, the right hand of fellowship, the kiss of charity, and dedicating babies. This was their nine rites, and this was definitely pushed um, uh, throughout throughout their teachings. They did not believe in receiving a salary. We talked about that. They did not feel that formal education was necessary. They believed in invitations and hymn singing. They believed in this. This was, they believed in calling people, even through an emotional appeal, let's call them to it. And they often refused uh, to send in reports of their records and statistics. The reason for this is kind of based on God's judgment toward David when he was counting um, and, and he was counting all the people and, and doing that. And there was major consequences for that. They're saying, hey, be, we're, we're going to be very careful. We're going to pull away from this idea of even getting close to pridefulness or we are keeping track of things because it's our doing. We're letting God work. And so that's what they were 
that's what they were pushing very strongly. Now, when we talk about these different play, uh, the, the separate Baptists and the regular Baptist or the old versus new lights, we're going to talk about these different areas where the rapid expansion took place. New England, um, we see some common patterns there. Baptists were extremely scarce before the mid 18th century there in New England. The surge of Baptists came from new light congregationalists and Baptist immigrants, people coming in. And this is how there was a, a surge in New England. The separate Baptist practiced fervent evangelism, which brought rapid growth. And so they were very strong, um, adamant about going forth and taking the gospel, doing a lot of mission activities. The early Baptists respected achievement more than privilege. So it wasn't about just my position and I'm owed something, the privilege of being something, but actually it's it's getting something, it's achieving something, it's going after something, it's getting the gospel to people, not just say, hey, I'm privileged, I don't have to do anything. And so that was a push there. Uh, I thought this was an interesting sign. I think this is well, maybe a sermon series for somebody, some church, but reaching where we're planted. Uh, this idea, wherever we end up, we reach people, and that's a lot of what the separate Baptists were doing at that time, um, is wherever they were, they were reaching out, and that was a focus that they had. The middle colonies are very different. Common patterns experience more freedom than other colonies. Uh, the middle colonies had no state church, so the Anglican church was in the south, southern colonies. You had the Congregational Church in, in New England area, the northern colonies, New England. But the middle colonies did not have a state church, so there was um, a lot of freedom there. They benefited for benefited from capable, capable leaders. And then the Philadelphia Association approved framework of for doctrines, confessions, church, church extensions, and religious tolerance. This was something that was major for uh, or what was coming out of Philadelphia. It was really helping um, kind of set the groundwork, the framework for how churches could do it, even the separate Separate Baptist. Uh, here's a church. Found this on the um, First Baptist Church Philadelphia website there, and it was talking about rendering of, of um, First Baptist Church there, and so that's kind of what we're seeing there. Going into the Southern Colonies, uh, common patterns there. The Southern col Southern Colonies had the slowest expansion of Baptist churches um, because of a few reasons. Um, and number one would be spare population in southern colonies. People were moving that direction. People were uh, moving south, but it was not full and it was a lot of land. And so there was a lot of space there. So spares population, strict regulation by the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church was was oppressive in some ways, and, and they tried to set the rules and set the tone of the way churches should be done and run. Um, and then spiritual lethargy, uh, this idea that it's just kind of uh, complacent, there's no real action, um, it's no, no, no movement. It's just kind of laziness and there's nothing going on. So with those, that strictness and, and, and the laziness, you have a lot of problems. Is it okay to be strict? I think that's a great question here when we're talking about churches. Some churches had good strict discipline, uh, which were still separatist churches, but some of them like the Anglican churches were strict in such a way it was oppressive and it was causing problems. And so people were trying to get out from under that and some were able to do that. Talking about regular Baptists in southern colonies planted churches on the coastline. These are more urban areas where uh, uh, were occupied by the Anglican influence. Um, and then you have the separate Baptists planted churches on the frontier. Cultural and doctrinal factors were easily spread throughout these rural areas areas and that's what you see going there this this cultural shift was easier to do when there wasn't the influence of a lot of people around it was easier to have some, to start something in kind of the middle of nowhere where you could bring in people and you could kind of do your own thing and that was easier to uh, bring in different doctrines easier to bring in a different culture because there wasn't big brother in a sense watching over you and so you could pull you could do a lot of different things and think of it just a small church out in the middle of the country and the people would come from all over and and you can read stories of people going 
traveling 40 miles from 40 miles away to come to these country churches because they knew it was going to be very unique and it was something um, they had heard about. And so they wanted to come with their families and check it out. And so that was happening in the southern colonies a lot. In Tennessee, by 1790, just I got to talk about Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee had 17 Baptist churches with 770 members. Most of the churches were separate Baptists and they were connected to the Sandy Creek Association in North Carolina. So we're talking about the east side, east part of the state of Tennessee. Um, while many of the early Tennessee churches started as separate Baptist churches, they quickly embraced the regular Baptist ways. And so what happened was they started out very strong with, um, with these uh, this new fervor, this push toward evangelism, this um, this focus on emotionalism in many ways. But as time went on and that uh, those things began to wane, what happened was is they kind of fell back into some re regular Baptist ways, and that was taking place in Tennessee as well. Um, and just kind of a sign there for you. Common patterns for the Southern Colonies will continue. Baptist growth was mainly the result of migration and not mission work. So it wasn't intentional mission activity. It was more of migration, trying to find, uh, trying to find something new. Families were seeking new social and economic opportunities in the South. And so that's what they were doing. This was a time of prosperity for a lot of people, and they were trying to go where they knew there would be prosperity. And they were hearing that people in Carolina, in the Carolinas, um, even, um, even as you go into Georgia, people were flourishing. People were prospering. They had these big farms, and, and they were doing so many things. And it, what, what happened was people were coming down so their families could prosper. They could set themselves up for a lot of success. And while this was happening, they came down and they shared and spread the gospel wherever they went. Um, and so that's what's happening. Separate Baptists strongly influenced the regular Baptists in the South, which eventually influenced the Southern Baptist Convention. And we're going to talk a lot about the Southern Baptist Convention in, uh, in, a, in later weeks, but um, just kind of a picture of it here of a group of people gathering together for it. But let's end right there. It's so good to be with you today. I hope you have a blessed day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.